for request tonight. Okay. Pray for Chantel this evening. I had an uncle that they were here a couple of years, maybe a year and a half ago. He came with his family, but anyhow, he just went into the hospital the day with COVID. Gail's mother-in-law. Amen. Brother Durr, would you lead us in prayer this evening? And uh, I know there's a number of needs uh, that you mentioned. We want to continue to pray for our elections, as uh, Brother Mike made mention of just a moment ago. And let's pray also for Sheila's sister, Sharon. And did have some good reports from the doctor this week, but obviously I have a lot more questions than just a lot more unknown. So we want to pray for Sharon tonight. Also pray for uh, their mother, Delight. And let's pray for our church. And uh, God's been helping and blessing, and I've often found in times like that, the devil ramps up his efforts. And so let's pray that God would, uh, would strengthen us as a church and uh, continue to bless us with his presence. Pray for Avis Flowers tonight and uh, just many other needs right here around us. So, Brother Durr, if you don't mind, why don't you lead us in prayer? And uh, let's join with him as he leads us tonight. Father, thank you for this time together. Yes, Father. Thank you. We thank you for this church with the lights on and the door open and the opportunity to come and worship and learn about you. And now tonight we're gathered here under these lights with one purpose and one heart and one desire. We want to please you. We want you to smile upon us when you look our way. And so we pray tonight that you would have your way in this service. We pray you'd touch our pastor as he leads it. We ask you, O oh God, to give him exactly the words that we need tonight from you. We ask you to touch our minds and our hearts. Help us to be able to comprehend your truth, to think uh, clearly and to assimilate it to our thinking and, our, and especially to our way of living. Lord, we want to live like a Christian in this world. We want our tracks to lead toward heaven and toward home. We want our lives to count for Christ. Now tonight we gather here and we have needs. You heard these voice requests and we bring them everyone to you and we ask you tonight to have your way in every one of them. Oh God, we wouldn't try to give you any order or tell you what to do uh, in any way, but we ask that your will be done. Yes. Here's some that need a healing touch and it may be your will to heal them. And if it is, we ask for a healing touch from God. And Lord, we pray for those that are in other situations. Some are uh, carrying heavy loads tonight, right here in this service. And we pray you would get under them and lift them and their load. To, oh God, we pray you would lift them up. We know that there is strength in you. There's power in Christ, and we pray tonight you'd help us to put our trust and our hope and our faith in you. Now, Lord, you know about our country and all that's going on these days, all the turmoil, all the, the fomenting wickedness of, of our day. And Lord, uh, the, the anger, the hatred, the, just the vitriolic hatred that's being spewed out all around us, and we see that and feel that so much. But, oh God, you've instructed us to pray for a peaceable and a quiet existence. Yes. And we pray for that. Will you put down the forces of evil? Oh God, we pray that you'd give us uh, just your help and your blessing. Lead our country back to God and yes. back to yes. Calvary, back to yes. Christ. We pray you'd do that. Give us a revival. A, a real true heart religion among us. Oh God, we don't know how to get it done, but you know. And we pray, oh God, that you would help us to know what our part in your great plan is and to do our part and to trust you with the results. 
We ask you now again to have your way in this service. And we'll give you praise for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Durr. Appreciate that so much. Doing a two-part lesson uh, from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, in which we studied this verse. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I mentioned uh, last week the importance of context, and this week I, I want to, uh, not to belabor the point, I'm not trying to um, add to my all, probably already lengthy uh, lesson, but I do want to go back and reiterate the importance of context as it specifically relates to this, uh, to this uh, verse, but also this is just good in general. So when you're reading the Bible on your own, uh, you're in Sunday school, you're hearing the preaching of God's Word, uh, there's a lot of different things we could look at that would help you understand context. But I just want to give you three things. Uh, and these are important no matter where you are, no matter who's speaking. Number one, it's important to notice the immediate context. In other words, we're looking at verse 14. It's important to look at the verses surrounding that verse. So last week, we read the entire seventh chapter, right? Why did I do that? Well, I, if I'm remembering correctly, I told you I wanted you to have a good understanding of what was going on, right? So why, do, why is context so important? Why can't we just cherry pick a verse out of Scripture and say, oh, well, this applies to me and my family. Why can't we do that? Well, because we need to look at what's surrounding it, and it's important. So number one, we look at the immediate context. Number two, we want to remember the larger context, which includes the, entire, the entirety rather of Scripture. So in other words... When we're looking at scriptures like this verse, if we just pull this verse out of thin air, can we study this verse in light of other verses or in light of the overall story of God's Word? Does it still apply? Okay? And the third thing we want to look at is we need to remember the historical cultural context. In other words, how would the verse have been understood by its original audience? Does this verse specifically apply to us right here in Franklin, Ohio in 2020? Or... Is it best suited and understood in the historical, cultural context in which it was written? And oftentimes, uh, we answer this third uh, point by looking at the first two. So, when reading this verse, the immediate context, as I said last Sunday night, the completion, uh, the, con the general context in this, uh, this chapter is the completion and dedication of the temple. So, that's very important to understand. This is not just some random verse. There's a reason why God gave it. There's a reason why Solomon wrote it down. There's a reason why uh, we're studying this. The, the Lord had appeared to Solomon and gave him warnings and gave him reassurances. If you do not do this, then I will not bless you. If you do this, I will bless you. So, Solomon, uh, when looking at this, uh, we, we need to understand the context here in this uh, particular chapter. Solomon very well uh, also could have recognized this warning as a reiteration of Deut Deuteronomy chapter 28, and I think it's Deuteronomy chapter 8 as well, and you can look at Joshua 1. Uh, there's a lot of different times in which uh, God gives a covenant or repeats a covenant with Israel. If you do this, then I will do this. If you do not, then I will not, right? Blessings and cursing. So again, we're remembering that uh, again as we study uh, tonight. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, the Lord is simply reminding Solomon of a previous agreement or of a previous covenant. And uh, then we also see not just the blessing that God promises, but we understand the judgment as well. So we move on and look at the context as it pertains to the entirety of Scripture. Uh, to be very clear, this is a promise to Israel. If they repent, they will, God will return to them. He will rescue them. However, there have been many, and we looked at this a little bit last week, which is why I'm, I'm harping on it again or maybe just reiterating again. There are many within even our own nation that say, well, this verse is for us. And Larry brought that up last week, and Lisa had a comment, and I had a comment, and there were several, Right. Well, isn't this just for the children of Israel? Well, what about those that are engrafted in? And well, what about the principle? And we looked at that. So I'm, the reason why I'm bringing this up, again, is to help us understand exactly uh, what this verse means and who it's for. Many, especially within Western civilization, have looked at this verse as a rallying cry for revival. Looking at this verse, and well, if we do these things, then God will bless us. God will bless us morally, God will bless us politically, God will bless us economically, God will bless us if we do these things. Well, 
One of the problems with looking at this verse in that specific light is that God has not promised a blessing upon the United States of America like he has with Israel. He has not gone into a specific covenant relationship with us like he did for them. So the terms that, that were applied to Israel do not, uh, do not apply to any other nation. And it's improper for us to kind of copy and paste. Like, well, we claim to be a Christian nation, so this must apply to us as well. Now, again, we have to understand the, the context of the entirety of Scripture, and we don't see that. That being said, as I mentioned last week, it does not make it improper for us to recognize our sin and confess and pray and seek His face. There is never a time in Scripture in which we are admonished not to confess our sin and seek His face and turn from our wicked ways. We've got to do that based on principle, right? So is this verse specifically to you and I? No. Is there principle that we could apply? Absolutely. So when Israel repented and sought the Lord, another thing we need to understand is that they were doing so in mass. Not every single Israelite was on their knees confessing and praying. But it was a, na it was a nationwide call to repentance. Never an indication of, of a small minority of a nation uh, that was repenting, but it was always the, the idea of a, the mass a group of individuals that were humbling themselves, offering sacrifices, sackcloth and ashes, tearing garments, I mean, sitting in, in absolute frustration and disappointment and guilt as they were confessing of sin. Is that where we are today? <laughs> As a nation, are the vast majority of 300 and some odd million people, are, are we doing that? No, we are not. No, we're not. But it is still our duty, as Brother Durr mentioned in his prayer in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, to pray for rulers, to pray for the king that we might live a peaceful life. There's still a, a Christian obligation and responsibility that you and I must partake in. It may be that God does bless us. It may be that God does bless our nation and bring prosperity. It may be that God brings about deliverance from sin and evil, and I pray that He does. But even if God does that, we must understand that it's not going to be specifically because of God fulfilling this particular promise. And again, I'm not trying to waste your time at all, but I want you to understand the context in which we're studying this verse. And as we studied this verse, there were four things. Do you remember what they were? They're right there almost. Well, they were in front of you. <laughs> Humility? Was that one of them? I think it was. What's that? Somebody help me out again. You can just say the same answer you gave me last week. I probably don't remember. And your neighbor doesn't either. What's humility? What does it mean whenever God told Solomon there in that 14th verse, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves? What's it mean? This is going to be a long right. night. Thank you. To think rightly of yourself. Think rightly of yourself. Very good. What does it mean to pray? Be a praying people. Probably more than letting I lay me down to sleep, right? As I tried to emphasize last week, I believe what God is telling Solomon and his people is that you must be a determined praying people. That you must continually seek my face. What does it mean to seek God's face? I talked about that a little bit. I was not satisfied in some of the information I gave you. Not that it was wrong. I just wasn't happy with it. Then I talked to Tim after service last week, Tim Wall, and, and he had made a note. And he was not struggling, but he was wrestling with this idea of seeking God's face. Has anybody given any thought to that this week? What does it mean to seek God's face? Yes. Anyone else? I liked that last week, and I like it this week too. We pray until we don't see anything but God's face. I read some. Sorry, somebody else? Well, I'm thinking if you look his face, would you want his approval? Is that mm -hmm. when you're seeking somebody's face, you want their approval? Again, so yes, yeah, so we're looking at these four areas, what it takes to, uh, to, to get. Uh, not to get, but to um, seek God's favor when we're looking at a national level. So we, we humble ourselves, we pray, and we seek His face. And we're going to look at the fourth one in just a moment. But four things that are paramount if we're going to have God's forgiveness, if we're going to have His blessing, and seeking His face, yes, is, is desiring Him 
above all else. And I was looking uh, this week at this phrase. And in the Hebrew, the word for face is often translated presence. So when we talk about seeking God's face, what we're really talking about is seeking God's presence. In which we are so in tune with Him, as, as Ms. Sheila said, that we pray and seek Him so earnestly that that's all we see. That that's all we want. That's all that we would even experience or want to experience is the very powerful, real presence of God. The psalmist said in, in 105 verse 4, Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His face forevermore. Oftentimes when we're talking about the outward appearance or the face in particular, uh, it's easy to see what the emotions are on the inside by looking at someone's face. Now, you may not understand that quite like I do. Maybe one of these days we'll get a massive mirror so you can see what I see. If you're like me, you don't do a very good job of hiding your emotions. Because usually what you see right here is pretty much what's going on in here and in here. I don't always do a good job of hiding how I really feel. And there's something about that where we're seeking to know the character, the person of God. We seek His face. We want to know all there is about Him. As James said, draw nine to Him and He will draw nine to us. Seeking Him. Longing for His presence. Whatever it takes to have Him. And we do that also in prayer in Psalm 24, verses 3 through 6. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. So I'm asking you, are you and I, are we seeking his face? Moving on to the fourth one, turning from wickedness or from our wicked ways. Talking about repentance, right? Proverbs 28, 13 says, He that coveteth, covereth, rather, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And just a reminder before we dive into the lesson tonight. If you and I are ever, let's forget the national revival. If you and I are ever going to have personal peace and the personal presence of God, we are going to have to turn from sin. We're going to have to forsake it all in all and declare and decide and determine to have God's presence. And that's never going to happen if we hide and suppress sin. We've reviewed, and now we're moving on, studying the second half of this verse if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, now we see the next part. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So let's look at this first phrase. Then will I hear from heaven. What does that mean to you? When you hear, what does that mean that God says, then will I hear from heaven? What does that mean to you? We've enacted the four things, right? What does it mean that God said, I will hear from heaven? What does that mean to you? You have clear, decisive answer. Okay. Clear, decisive answer. Anyone else? It's sort of like if you have a radio, you tune, you're tuning that dial, and you take the time to tune that in perfectly. And once you get it in here, once you get it tuned in perfectly, you hear from heaven. Well, I like that. He said it's like the dial on a radio, right? The old fashioned radio. The old fashioned radio, thank you. <laughs> In the truck like I drive, yeah. Where it's got the, the seek and then it's got the tune, right? So the seek just goes to the, most, the strongest, clearest station, right? But then what he's talking about is the tune, where it's just one click at a time until you can get the perfect reception or you can hear absolutely perfectly. And Paul's understanding, and I like that. That's what God's talking about. Then God hears. Right? It's when we are in tune with Him. I was doing some more studying on this word hear. What does it mean to hear? Well, it means to incline the ear favorably to what is being spoken. 
So we're, in other words, to incline, in other words, we're pushing everything aside, all distractions, as Paul's saying, and it's almost like we're leaning in, we're tuning in to what is being said. We're, we're really dialing in to what is being spoken. We're, we're coming in and saying, now exactly what do you want from me? This isn't just white noise. It's not just out there and just kind of bouncing around. No, we're, 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 we're honing in on exactly what's being said. And we see this all throughout Scripture. We actually noticed it this morning of God hearing his people. He heard their cry. He heard their sorrow. He heard them. He was tuned in to their voice, tuned in to their agony. And we see that all throughout Scripture. And as I was reading and as I was researching, I thought it was interesting, uh, I found this statement. that unlike ancient religions that sought revelation through the eye and through visions, biblical people primarily sought revelation through the ear and through hearing. Not all the time, but oftentimes. Hearing symbolized the proper response to God in the scriptures. God opens the ears to hear his word, gives ears of the prophets his revelation, and exhorts his people either directly or through prophets to hear his word. Lack of hearing, however, is the decisive spiritual failure and rebellion against God. Is it any wonder Jesus gave these words? He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. If he has ears to hear, if he's willing to listen, if he's willing to push aside all the distractions, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. To hear the words of God is to be a child of God and a sheep hearing the voice of the shepherd. Not to do so is to be spiritually hard of hearing and to remain unforgiven. This author went on to say, hearing is blessing in life and not hearing is judgment. Well, I thought that was interesting. A lack of hearing is the decisive spiritual failure and rebellion against God. What are your thoughts on that statement? That's pretty powerful, isn't it? A lack of hearing is the decisive spiritual failure and rebellion against God? I'll just remind you this evening, God is speaking. He's talking. So I don't hear anything. Is your Bible open? God is speaking to us, and for us to tune him out and just turn the volume all the way to the left until it clicks to off. This author said, is spiritual failure and it is rebellion. I appreciate what God is telling Solomon that he will hear from heaven. I thought the location was interesting. That God is sitting in heaven and he hears from that position. He say, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, I think it's interesting because it reminds me that God is not of this world. That he is high and holy and lifted up. He's removed. Not that he doesn't understand. Not that he's removed from the sense that he doesn't care. We looked at, again, we looked at that this morning. But that God is above all the stuff. And yet he's able to still look down and care and zoom in on us. In his place of he- in, in his dwelling place, the glory of the heavenlies, <laughs> that he's up in the heavens, even tonight, and he looks down upon us and he knows us. I'm not re preaching this morning's message, but there's something about God being removed and yet still intimately connected with us, his people. And when you and I are willing to humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our sins, in his position, he has promised, I will hear you from heaven. I'll hear you. I'm tuned in. If you'll do these things, I'm all in. I'm engaged. Encourage tonight to know that God is still connected. Encourage tonight to know that there's nothing that we're experiencing that has God so turned off that he doesn't care about us. Even in the midst of the sin of our nation, God is still in tune even to those that are crying out to him for help. Any further thoughts on this before we move on to this next point? Hey, Pastor, in this... Seeing as a two two piece thing, Mm -hmm. um, seeking his face and then hearing from heaven, we have lots of ways to communicate. I mean, we used to you pass notes or you just send a letter. I remember sending uh, recordings on cassettes to grandparents. Then there's phone calls and there's lots of ways to communicate. But then there's some conversations where we have to be with that person, Mm -hmm. and that's seeking his face and then hearing from heaven. That's when we have got together. We're not sending messages through any other means. This is me and God together right now. We're, we're together face to face. Which I think, I, I think that's why I appreciate the illustration Paul is giving. Because we're, we're in tune. I mean, we're, we're dialed in. 
not looking at the other things that sure we can communicate other ways, but this is intentional, it's just us. And it's true. I mean, I, there's a lot of conversations I don't mind having through texting, but some things you just gotta pick your phone up and call somebody. And then there's conversations where I need to see the whites of your eyes and you need to see the whites of my eyes. <laughs> I mean, we need to sit snout to snout. We need to have a conversation, right? <laughs> I know, it's fine. Somebody said last week regarding praying and communicating to God out there, what it said, it was that praying isn't getting into things like that, it's getting into things like God. Mm-hmm. And I thought that funny as well. I like that. Praying is not getting us to or not getting God to think like us, it's getting us to think like God. I'm telling you, friends, there's something very powerful about getting on the same page as God. There's something very, uh, very unique that takes place when you and I get on the same level, not that we can rise to Him. I, I hope you understand what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being on the, we want the same desires, we want the same passions, we want the same thing, that we want to seek His face, hear from Him, and He hears from us. Any other thoughts? idea of God hearing us is interesting. Mm-hmm. You ever, if you ever dealt with somebody's hard of hearing, hmm? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about Elijah and those prophets of Baal. He said, pray louder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we act like God's hard of hearing, mm-hmm. and he isn't. But to, to hear <laughs> That's, a, that's an interesting concept. And dist- as you said this morning, your message, to di- or sometimes this morning, distinguish our voice. He doesn't get our request mixed up with somebody else. He, he distinguishes that. that. That to me is it's interesting. It's, it's powerful. Mm-hmm. I have always said, and this kind of blows my theory out of the water, but I've always said there's a difference between hearing and listening. Hearing to me, I'm, I'm, I hear a lot of things, but to listen, and I kind of, when I read this, and Scripture kind of reshapes how I, how I interpret that, because God's talking about hearing, right? And it's very, I can remember being a kid, and you get to Walmart or Kohl's or wherever with your family, and you get separated. I can hear my dad's piercing whistle above anything else. And I know it's not the manager. I know it's not the clerk. I know it's not mom. It's dad. Because I've heard that, and there's a rush of emotions that go through my little mind. <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> did he really know I just did that? And what's going to happen? There's a lot of things. Because I'm tuned into dad. I know dad's whistle. And to this day, you just can't do it. I just know dad's whistle. I know dad. There's something about that with God, too. As God, or as Jesus spoke about, uh, that the sheep hear His voice. They know Him. There's something about that too. They don't chase after the hireling. The hireling doesn't care. Jesus, the good shepherd, cares about the sheep. There's something to that as well. You work on a sermon. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> Any other thoughts on this? I was just thinking about what's the other scripture talks about a sounding gong, and it's just nothing. You know. It's it's getting rid of all that peripheral yes. and getting down to the business. I like that. <laughs> Let's look at this. If we get there. Then will I forgive theirs. What is forgiveness? And this is God speaking. Then will I forgive their sins. So we've humbled ourselves, we've confessed, we're praying, we're seeking his face. And God says, all right, now I'll hear from heaven. And I'll forgive their What does that mean? What is forgiveness? Forgive means to let it go. I like that. Won't hold it against us. Won't hold it against us. Okay. Let it go. Won't hold it against us. What else does it mean? The consequence has been removed. Consequences have been removed. Okay. It's Sorry. I mean, you think consequences being removed is all part of that? Just people are going to wear scars for the rest of their life. It may not be sin, but it's the scars. Yeah, punishment. The punishment. The punishment's been forgiven. Maybe it's not consequence as in eternal death. Okay. Yeah. I like that. 
the punishment. Uh, yeah. So we still have consequences for our sin, but the punishment is there. I asked for a lot of forgiveness growing up, and it didn't matter. Yeah. There were still consequences. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe Dad knew I wasn't serious. <laughs> I think there's something to that. There's, all, there's often a price to pay. In fact, there's always a price to pay for sin. God is talking about forgiving our sin. So what does that look like from God to us? That's wonderful. But what does it mean you to me? Same thing apply? Do we let it go? We should, but normally we don't. We still have back of our mind because we can't erase the memory of mm-hmm. what happened to us. It's hard to erase the wrong when you know, it's staring in the face every time you see it. Mm-hmm. I mean, we don't put, ju- we don't apply judgment on them for that. I like that. Forgiveness is not applying judgment. Am I understanding you correctly? Yeah. Okay. We love being forgiven by the Lord. Right? Slate's wiped clean. He doesn't, from the east from the west, he remembers it no more. We just couldn't be happier. Well, there's something to this one-on-one forgiveness. And I was reading again from Psalm 51. I'm telling you, that is the most gut-wrenching chapter in all of Scripture with forgiveness. Now, you go back and read it sometime. I mean, it... You know, Nathan, the prophet Nathan approaches David, gives him a scenario, and David just drops the hammer of justice. Well, if it were me, I would do such and such. And Nathan said, well, you're the man. You're the one I'm talking about. And sometime later, here we have these words. Not all, I'm not reading the entire chapter, just the highlights. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. Thou God of my salvation. The sacrifice of God, our broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. I just want to take a very quick detour here to remind you that you need to know God not only has the ability to forgive you, but he can forgive you. And you say, well, this is Sunday night. I mean, you ought to know your crowd. My goodness. Yeah, yeah, I do. But I just want you to understand tonight. Sometimes there's things that we carry and we don't tell anybody else about. And it can weigh us down and it can burden us. Friends, just put the pride aside. If you need to confess sin to the Lord, do it. It's worth it. And when you read the 51st Psalm, we understand David hid this from everybody for a very long period of time. But when it all came out, David was more than willing to confess it and give it to the Lord. And there was immediate peace. There were still consequences, right? But there was immediate peace and restoration and joy. As David talked about, restoring me the joy of thy salvation. Pastor, don't you think that sometimes the devil uses it though, where people have a hard time forgiving themselves and that can defeat if they can't forgive themselves? I, I think she's talking about, can the devil make it difficult for us to forgive ourselves, right? I, I think that sometimes can actually be the most challenging part. Is not, is not, I mean, it's, it's tough to admit and then confess and then to lay it all out on the line. But I think, I think you're really on to something. There's something even greater about being able to let go of what we have done ourselves. And that, it's different for every person. That, that is a very real, that's a very real challenge. Brother Dirk. I think we're living in a world where sin is so lightly taken. Mm-hmm. Well, to forgive sin, there's only one way God can forgive sin. That's to transfer the guilt onto Jesus. Otherwise, we're in line for death. And in David's case that you referenced earlier, the, the guilt, both he and Bathsheba, should have been executed. But the, their guilt was transferred in a very real way to that child. Yes. The child died in their place. It was a forerun, as a forecast for Calvary when God, on an innocent Savior, He knew no sin. Mm-hmm. The only way He can forgive my sin is that Jesus died. He died for me. In order for the forgiveness of sins, something has to die. That's right. Blood has to be shed. And you're 100% right in this particular 
context of David's forgiveness of his confession. He didn't pay the personal price. I mean, he did. But you're right, they're a child. Well, see, there was, no, there was no sacrifice for the sins they committed. There just wasn't any. The only remedy was death. In the law, there's no forgiveness in the law. There's substitutionary sacrifice to, to delay that execution or the punishment until Jesus would come. It looks forward to Christ. All those animals and everything. There's certainly to this, something to this reality of personal confession and being forgiven of sin. And I said it was a quick detour and it was more like a lengthy detour. But getting back to the national scope of things, on a national level, the sins of the children of Israel varied, right? There was rebellion, there was idol worship. They, they, they would repent, 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 and not tear down the high places. You read that in the Old Testament over and over and over. There was pagan marriages. There was grumbling and griping and complaining. I mentioned that this morning. And yet there was pride over and over and over. There was always pride that their way was the best way. So my question to you, is there such a thing as a national sin? Is there, is there something to this idea of the sin of the people in which you and I, or rather that they, could ask for forgiveness on a national, is that, is that biblical, that they could pray a prayer of national repentance? Does that make sense? Daniel did. Daniel did? Okay. What about you and I? What about today? Can we offer God a national prayer of repentance? No, because some people aren't sorry for the sins they've committed. No, because some people aren't sorry for the sins they've committed? Okay. Let me read this prayer to you. We have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. Too proud to say or too proud to pray to the God that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. Who do you think, who do you think wrote that and prayed that? Good job, Mike. Abraham Lincoln, March 30th, 1864. 1863, four. I'll give it to you since you knew it. You're probably right on that. I think there is something to a national prayer of repentance. I think there is something to that, Swigs, even though we don't have everybody bowing the knee. I still think there's something that's important that as a leader, there's understanding we have transgressed the holy God. We, we've become self-sufficient, superior in our own selves, and we need to ask forgiveness for the national sins that we have committed. If you're looking for more of a biblical uh, example, Brother Durr gave us Daniel. I looked at Ezra uh, chapters 9 and 10. I mean, the prophet comes, and you can read Ezra 9 and 10 on your own account. I mean, Ezra talks about pagan marriages over and over, and I mean, he lists them out. <laughs> the abominations of the Canaanites, Hittites, uh, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, and a bunch of other ites. I mean, Ezra just comes right out and says it. says, hey, we've done wrong. And for all of chapter 9, all of chapter 10, I mean, Ezra just, he shreds his garments from his sackcloth and ashes and the people, he calls them to a national repentance. You could look at the book of Jonah, the Ninevite people. Once Jonah finally got his act together and went and to, to Nineveh and to preach the gospel, listen to this. The people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Well, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? I love that 10th verse. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would not do unto them, and he did it not. The point I'm trying to make tonight is that 
God was serious with Solomon. If you transgress me, look at the verse, the 13th verse, if I shut up heaven, that there's no rain. If I send locusts, if I send pestilence, if you will do these things, I will hear. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I'll do it. But what about us as Christians? Are we willing? Are we willing to ask God's forgiveness? I mean, look at the sins of our nation, the legalization of abortion and same-sex marriage. Are we willing to say, Lord, it's not us, but we're in this mess. Would you forgive us of our sins as a nation? I'm not saying if we don't do that, God's not pleased. And I don't know where that line is because we could run down that rabbit trail real quick and for a long, long time. But I do think, based on the references that I've given to you tonight, there's something there's something about God's people, or specifically here the context of children of Israel, crying out to God for His help and His blessing and His forgiveness. And any thoughts on that, on asking for prayers of repentance for the nation or seeking forgiveness? Any, any thoughts or comments on that? There certainly is precedent for it in the Scripture mm -hmm. where God is looking. He said He was looking for someone to stand in the gap. Right. And the the scripture that gets my attention is that God wonders that there was no one. He said if I could just find one. One person. Then I'd forgive the whole city. We just find one. To me that's staggering. That hits us. Hits us where we are. And it causes me to wonder today, where are we? We look pretty, we come to a nice place, we claim to know how to worship. Where are we? Let's move on thirdly and finally, and God gives this. Then will I heal their land. What does this mean to you? God hears from heaven, he forgives their sin, now he says, I will heal their land. What does that mean? Are we talking about economically? Is God talking about politically? Is God talking about financially or morally or in terms of militaristic power? What's God talking about? Well, if you do these things, then I'll hear and I'll forgive and then I'll heal. What's God talking about? Or is God talking about something totally different when he's talking about healing the land? What's he talking about? I think we've been dancing around it. I think God is talking about healing the land spiritually. We've talked about forgiveness. But you know, forgiveness isn't the final step. It's somewhere, forgiveness is somewhere in the middle. After forgiveness, there's this whole thing. <laughs> there's this whole thing called trust. And we've got to rebuild it. When you get forgiveness or you ask forgiveness from somebody else, then there's this process of rebuilding the trust because trust has been broken somewhere. At least in human relationships, that's how it goes. And when you read the Old Testament, you realize that the high places were removed and there was a coming back to God. There was a process, but sacrifices or the high places were torn down and people came back to God and there were sacrifices offered and there was worship that then took place and slowly but surely the people came back to God and God came back to them and began to spiritually turn them back to Him and heal their land. And I, I think there's something to this, even for us tonight. I know and realize that we're looking at a specific group of people in a specific time period. I, I understand that this evening. But again, I, I'm, I'm arguing there's a principle here that you and I need to realize that if we are really called by his name, I, we're not a part. I, I understand that. But as Christians, are we really willing to humble ourselves? Are we really willing to pray and seek his face and want his presence and dwell in his power? Are we really willing to confess and turn from sin? Are we really willing then to have God say, OK, I've heard you. OK, I'm forgiving you and I'm going to heal you. But there's a process to this. Now it's time to walk day by day with me. It's a, it's a process. It's a journey. It's not all of a sudden the finish line. There's a process in walking with Christ. This is why Peter said growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Any thoughts or comments on that? You know, I was thinking, uh, Mitch? For, for me, it's getting my priorities in, in, in place, you know, for God, you know, being the most main, your whole focus is on Him. And, and I was thinking about the sword in, in Mark 4, where it talks about, and the cures of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, all this stuff, we're allowing this stuff to come in and, and blind us. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. There's something to that that gets us distracted from the goal, the mission of Christ. There's something about the cares of this world and all the things that gets us sidetracked. It may not be anything bad. It may not be anything sinful. It may not be, you know, the legalization of abortion. It may be other things in our own personal lives, right? That gets us distracted from all of what God wants us to do. And I, I fully believe with all my heart that there's, God cares as much about that, the little things that we may not give a lot of credence to, as much as He cares about the big things. That's why I'm, 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 I'm hitting this, <laughs> that you and I are going to have to humble ourselves and pray and seek His face and turn from our wicked ways. Understanding that it is at that point that God hears from heaven and forgives and heals. And so my question to you is actually perfectly tied into what Mishius brought up. Are we really willing to do that? Do we really want that? Are we willing to get, get, get away from all the peripheral? Are we willing to really want God? Are we willing to really want His kingdom to come and His will be done? I've been talking about the keys to revival. On a national scale, sure. But I hope you have been seeing the underlining truths of a personal revival in you and in me. The correlation is identical. It's true that you and I are going to have to do some things in our own personal lives if we want God to work among us. I hope that as you're fasting and praying on Tuesdays, some of these thoughts are churning around in your heart and in your mind. Reading these scriptures and saying, Lord, is there anything I need to do? Is there pride in my life? Am I a prayerless person? Am I seeking everything else but your face? Am I refusing to turn from my wicked ways? Because if any of those four things are true, then He's not going to hear from us or we're not going to hear from Him and there's not going to be forgiveness and there's no healing in our land. I believe with all my heart the steps to a national revival begin on a personal level. We've got to have Him. Pastor and people like we've got to have Him. Any final thoughts or questions before we close in prayer tonight? I wanted to look at, these, at this verse and its context for the last couple of weeks, tonight and last week, as we're looking at our upcoming elections, I believe God wants uh, to help us as a nation. I'm not talking about financially. I'm not talking about housing markets and job rates. But I, think, I don't think God's done with us spiritually. And I'm wondering, as Brother Durer mentioned, I'm wondering how much we actually really do want Him. Or are we just kind of comfortable with the American dream? God, help me. I'm asking God to. On these Tuesdays, I'm asking specifically, Lord, is there anything I need to do? Am I blocking the channels of revival at the Franklin Bible Methodist Church? Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being together today. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to not just be together, but to worship you and to study your word. And Lord, tonight as we have once again attempted to study your word from this particular passage of scripture, we realize there are some, some prerequisites to having your favor and to having your blessing and to having your presence. And Lord, I'm asking tonight that you would again search each of our hearts. Lord, we don't want to keep anything suppressed. We don't want to keep anything hidden. We're not looking to stand up in front of folks and make confessions and admittance. But Lord, are there things in our lives that we need to get out of the way in order for you to work and move among us? Yes, we're very concerned about our upcoming election. We're, we're concerned about the, the, the consequences. We're concerned about the future. We, we are, admittedly, we're concerned about a lot of things. We should. We, we're here. And this is our nation. But Lord, I'm praying that you would help us locally, right here, that we would have your smile of approval. That we would be so dialed in and tuned into your voice that we have you, your presence, your power, we have you and, and only you. And so search our hearts from the oldest to the youngest, every one of us, Lord, 
If there's anything we need to root out, if there's anything we need to confess, if there's anything we need to get out of the way, Lord, help us to do just that so that we might have all of you that we need and that we can handle so that we might be a city set upon a hill shining as beacons and of light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. So bless your people tonight as we go our separate ways and give us a good week. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming this evening. The Lord bless you. You're dismissed.